So Touch Designer is a super powerful tool, even if you just use the most basic version, which involves sort of all your comps, tops, chumps, and materials. But then we have this big section of DATs that unless you're using folder in or tables, require a lot of power from, from Python or Touch touch script, which is the sort of the old outdated programming language. So what we're going to do today is quickly explore sort of an introduction to Python within Touch Designer to, to help you start unlocking the full potential of what you can do inside the program. So in a normal network when you're using it, you can bring in your objects, attach them wherever you need them, or you can right click at the end and it'll show you sort of what it thinks are compatible nodes based on what you've, you've taken in. For example, this movie in file. It shows us ones that it can instantly go into without needing any extra changes. For example, we can go straight into a crop and, and cut it short. Every, mostly every, can, every node in Touch Designer also is fully enabled by Python or Touch Script if you want to change it. So when we click on a node, in the top right hand corner, we'll see this little Python symbol that we can change to switch to the, uh, the touch script, which is like the native touch designer program language. But in Python, a super friendly, but really powerful programming language that we can use to enhance every aspect of our touch designer experience. So to have a quick overview, by default, as I showed you, all networks have Python embedded in it. And Python is running throughout the entire touch network. So if we bring in something like a text, I'm just going to split off my screen here with a second section that I'm going to change to the textport and dat. So I've split this off and changed it to textport and dat. And this means that I can edit and textport and control what I'm editing over here without having to go to an external editor. When you get into much more detailed programming or you get more comfortable, you can go into the preferences. Apparently not, there we go, Take, taking his time to pop up. And in DATS, you can set the custom text and table editor to an external uh, executable. So you can use something like Notepad++ or Sublime Text Editor. And it means that it's much easier to control your, your error or catch your errors. The one caveat being that they don't support the the touch specific operators that we'll get onto in a bit. So, as I was saying, Python is running within Touch Designer at all times by default. So we can do something like edit the contents of this box to say print hello world. Print being a very basic Python command to print whatever we want it to. And if I do Alt R Alt R being the, the command to run the script. You'll see we get hello world every time I do it oh. in the right hand uh, text editor or in the right hand text port. With Python always running, it means that we can always have almost instant compiling and error checking within the environment. So for, for example, I made a mistake and didn't close this off and tried to run it. My node is going to tell me that there's an error in my script and then my uh, text port is going to tell me nearly exactly where that problem is using Python's base compiler. So for example, it says uh, end of line while scanning string literal and it gives me a little indicator of where it thinks the error is and all it's saying is it expected something here at that curly bracket but it didn't get it before it saw the bracket. So if we put back in the tab, altar, hello world. One of the most powerful things about Python is it automatically assigns classes to variables. So if you're familiar with programming at all, you'll usually see variable or a normal programming line would be int var1 is equal to some number. And what that's saying is that we're going to define an integer, its name, and then what it's actually equal to. In Python, we don't need that at all because it will automatically sign a type to that variable based on what it thinks it's receiving. So whereas normally we'd need something like int var1 is equal to 10, string var2 is equal to hello, 
and then string var3 is equal to world. We just don't need that in Python. So we can remove this and this and this. And this will still work perfectly. It will know that 10 is an integer or a float if we put in a point. It will know that hello is a string and world is a string. And it will automatically support these by default. So I can do print var1, push all r, and it will automatically print 10.0. Same with var2, it will automatically print hello as a string without me needing to tell it what it is. And this makes it a, a much nicer program for us to work with when we're trying to, when we're programming, because you don't need to take into consideration the, the variable assignment. You will still run into issues if you're trying to cross over different variable types at the same time. For example, if I try and print var1 and or if I do variable2 plus, let me add a new one, var34 is equal to 20. If I do variable1 plus variable4 in this print message, it will be able to do this calculation because it knows both of these are integers. Run it and we get 30.0. So it automatically assigns the output of this as a, new uh, as a new floating variable without us having to tell it at all. So it's a much more human way of programming. You don't need to think about, okay, what am I assigning to memory? What type of variable is this? Where is it gonna stay? It, it becomes like more and more writing English or writing mathematical equations when you're doing calculations but it will get very angry if I try and add variable one to variable two. So it'll tell us unsupported operate operand types for float and string, as saying basically you cannot add a float and a string together. But being as smart as it is, we can command Python to show variable one as a string, plus no longer, plus we'll still add them, quote unquote, but this time it will just join the two strings together. So instead of having a new, a sum output, we just have a new string output. So variables, which we'll get into in more detail, are super flexible and very, very easy to work with inside Python because of its ability to auto handle the ins and outs. One of the main benefits of variables when touch designer though is that we don't need to write them like this. We can bring them in from other sources. So for example, if we have something like a chop that is a, an LFO or a low frequency oscillator, I want to use this value to manage my program somehow. So how would I do that? Well, I know this object's name and I can see it's got something called Chan1. So why wouldn't I reference that? So if I come in here and change my variable one, I'm just gonna change, cut this out and put it at the bottom so I know what that is. So instead of variable one, I'm gonna change this to reference this variable here. And we can see an example of how we would code that. If we make another, so if we do a constant and then that you may have come across this before you started programming is if I click and drag, if I click and drag into the right place, you'll see we get the option to export the chop, export the relevant chop reference, or the chop reference. Now, if I do either of these two, it's going to give us uh, the same variable in here in the constant. But if I do chop reference, it's going to do a little bit of Python programming for me automatically. And this is denoted by the, the Python link between it, the code link going between the two. But what you'll see is we have something called OP, which stands for operator. Then in parenthesis, we have the full name of the our origin, and then square brackets, the name of the channel we want to take from. Because of where, because of the type of reference I exported, it included the full name for the LFO. But because these are on the same level with a network, we could remove that and just reference the name as LFO1 because this can only, LFO1 can only exist once within this level of the, uh, the network. Chan1 
refers to the specific name. So if I change the channel to channel 4, we suddenly we get a scripting error similar to what we were seeing before. So this is saying float argument must be a string or number, not none type. So basically it's saying chan1 doesn't exist anymore. So instead of referencing this by channel name, we can reference it by channel index. So this piece of code is going to look at LFO1 and then go to index 0, which is the, the lowest slot it can go to, and get its value. If I add a second channel, not to that, if I added a second channel to this, I could tell this to reference index 1, or I could tell it to reference, if I copy this, index 0. Both of these will still be valid, but then I could also change this back to be chan2 and that would still work equally well. We'll come back to this in a, a bit later in the tutorial when we look at referencing within operators. But for now, we're going to use that same logic. Instead of variable 1 being equal to 10, I'm going to make variable 1 equal to this LFO. So I'm going to say, go and get the operator of LFO1 and read its 0 index value. Nothing happened. But now, if I print variable one, you'll see that if I keep running this at different times, we'll keep constantly get a different value for variable one. So now we have Python running inside Touch Designer, but taking a variable from a very real example. So <clears throat> what could we actually do with this? This is a brilliant segue into a brilliant example of what, why Python is so powerful within Touch Designer. So let's take this an example. So let's say every time that this value is greater than zero, I want something to happen. How would you do that in Touch Designer normally? With a, a case this simple, you could do something like a, a logic. And then, so this is going to display one every time that this is greater than zero. Now, every time that this is greater than zero, I also want to change the text in a box like mm, So let's say we do text. I'm going to do one that says hello One that says world going to put in a switch and then I am going to link this in here so now this is a visual representation of something that we can do super super simply in Python without the need for all these cooking and converting between chops and dats so in here I'm going to make what we call an else statement. So if something happens and the inclusion of a hashtag or a hash means simply comment and the compiler will ignore it completely. So if is a valid piece of code, anything this side of it is no longer. So if my variable one is greater or equal to zero, semicolon, do something. And inside the if statement, I'm going to indent it or tab it in to denote to the program that we're inside a function. So in here we do something, and that something is going to be so if variable is greater than we're gonna say so variable four. Oh, I don't even need this. So variable four, I want that to equal hello. Else so if variable one is less than zero, I want variable four to equal world. And then I'm going to print variable four. So now if I run this, uh, we will get an error, obviously. 
line 10 world. Oh, that's what happens when you don't put on a semicolon. I'm going to push tab, uh, speech. Now if I run it, you'll see we get world, hello world, hello world, hello world, hello. So instead of this simply cooking, is the process of an action causing an effect in touch design. Now instead of this changing on cook, I can now get the result no matter what, where in this ramp or the sine wave this value is, which means that multiple times throughout its movement I can get a value for it. And you can see, while well, this is a super simple one to, to visualize in Touch Designer, there's also a case for it here where we only wrote five lines of code and we did the exact same thing without using any more resources. And instead of having it in a dot, I now have a variable that I can do whatever I want with. So as an example, I could do text and do output. Instead of printing variable four, what I'm going to do is I am going to tell variable four to go into here. So in the exact same way that we referenced LFO one up here, I am going to tell it to reference output. Again, I don't need anything else because it's within the same level of the network. Dot text is equal to variable four. Now, hopefully, if I run it, you'll see that the text inside variable uh, inside output is equal to variable four. And to spice it up a little bit, we could do hello. I'm going to change the way variable four is represented to show variable hello plus. And as we learned before, it won't handle a string and an integer together. So I'm going to turn variable one into a string. Now if I run it, you'll see that we need a bit of rounding, but the variable, very quickly we have made something that would be very convoluted to do using touch designer nodes alone. It also handily introduced us to the concept of if else loops, where we have an action and a consequence. If I comment this out and this out, this is still a completely valid piece of code. All it's going to do is make variable for, for exist when the case is true. So I will get an error saying that world is not defined. Oh, I'm a, I've got the wrong piece of code highlighted. So I'm trying to run this. What I want to do is highlight this and run it. So I'll clear that so we can see it run it and you'll see that there is an error on line 12 because variable 4 isn't defined and the reason variable 4 isn't defined is because variable 1 was not greater or equal to 0. Uh, one way to solve that is if we create variable 4 as a no value, none, it's defined in that. So now we'll either get variable 4 is not defined, variable 4 so now we either get none or hello in the value, or we add in this else statement that basically says variable four is equal to something else. So in here, I could quite easily do the same and say none. Run it. So as well as supporting if statements, if else statements, which are the most commonly used you can also use other types of common loops, such as fars and whiles. So we'd use a for loop to print out a certain number of variables based on uh, a range. So we would do something like for x in range variable, variable 1. And what I'm also going to do is do variable 1 type is equal to variable 1 times 10 just to turn this into a whole number print x so I'm just going to remove this as well so what this is going to do now is whatever LFO1 is at the time of running 
it's going to loop through x that number of times times 10. So line 7, float cannot be interpreted as an integer. So if we do like that, Also going to change this to be a ramp rather than a sine wave because when it's negative it doesn't print anything click here so every time I run it now we're going to get different numbers of outputs based on the LFO in and its integer value so when it's six we're only going to get five zero five outputs So for loops are doing is when you need to loop something for a very specific amount of time. So whether you're doing a calculation uh, based on an array or you want to find out, find something in a list as an example. So say you had a massive list of text, you could then search through it to find something on a certain row and return true when it reaches that row. One of the, the final loop type is called a while loop. And you normally do not use these at all in touch designer mainly because Python will lock down touch designer during its time. So for example, if I do while fair one is less than or equal to zero, print variable one, and I'm going to remove this line, and then I'm going to run it. Oh, I'm going to change this back to a sine wave. you'll see that when I run it, the condition being true, Touch Designer essentially breaks. There are, it should eventually come back round, depending on the sort of calculation you're asking it to do, it will all, nearly always freeze in a circumstance like this. So with that, I'm gonna close Touch Designer.